this workshop is we can end the epidemic, really. And the reason that's its title is because there is such great hope from more than one direction that actually that's possible. Now, there's two things that I think um, we've been hearing about and that we will hear about in different forms today. One is that, as you heard from Timothy Brown earlier today, the possibility of a cure has now re-entered um, the conversation related to HIV. You know, we had a slide at, a, at another program we had earlier in AIDS Education Month that said, you only have to see one talking dog to know that dogs can talk. In other words, I see not, so I think everybody gets it, but in other words, you know, a principle has probably been established here. But, as we also heard, that particular way of getting to a cure is not practical. We need to find other ways where we can get to a cure where the cure is not equally likely to kill the patient and where, unfortunately, the cure is not so expensive that in the American context, as we also heard this morning, it will never get paid for. So, it's complicated. At the same time, research over the past three years has demonstrated pretty conclusively that tools that are available to us today have the potential to end the AIDS epidemic. But again, that's too simple. The fact that something could work doesn't mean that when you get into the real world, it will work. And yet, one thing that we really wanted to talk about today was what those tools are, free exposure, prophylaxis, and prevention as treatment. Because unless people know about this and know what this research has really said and demonstrated, they're not going to be able to think creatively about what we could do to see if this really could have the impact that many of us hope that it will have. So we're going to hear today from three people. We're going to hear from Joe Garland, who's going to talk about the research that I just mentioned. We're going to hear from Luis Montenegro, who is going to talk about research toward a cure that the Wistar Institute and Philadelphia Fight have been working on. And we're going to hear from Rob Lehman, who is, I guess at this point, an old head in the AIDS epidemic, who has been working with people with HIV for a very, a very long time. Um, and I'll say more about each of them when I introduce them. So, I am first going to introduce Joe Garland, who we'll hear from first, um, and then Luis, and then Rob. So, Joe Garland works at Fight. He's a staff physician at the Jonathan Lyons Treatment Center. He treats people with HIV and AIDS. Joe is a graduate of the Harvard Medical School. He did an internship at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and then he completed his residency and his fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, after which we felt very lucky um, that he was interested in coming to the last center to be one of the physicians there. Joe is board certified in general internal medicine and infectious diseases, and he is focused his medical career on serving individuals in complex social situations, people who are affected not just by the disease, but by the social conditions that have made them vulnerable to the disease. And in addition to um, his work at Fight, he works also at clinics serving refugees in the city of Philadelphia, a clinic for Spanish-speaking immigrants, and also works at Prevention Point Philadelphia. Um, which is, among other things, our city's needle exchange program. He's also the director of the Global Health Track for Internal Medicine Residents at the University of Pennsylvania, which trains residents in working in resource poor environments in Africa. So we're very glad that Joe agreed to do this presentation this morning.
And then uh, the logical transition is to what's on the horizon, which is least of the cover. Um, I think you would have to uh, really not be paying attention for the last couple of years not to know that there's been a lot of big news out there um, in HIV care and treatment. Um, we actually heard today from Timothy Brown, who uh, we covered in Science Magazine this past year, which is a, a, a big deal medical journal, as, as I'm sure everybody knows, um, called Treatment Prevention, the Breakthrough of the Year, covered the economics, the end of AIDS, um, Obama does this on um, the speech. This has been um, a huge um, uh, year, or past couple of years in HIV. So to talk a little bit more about these two ideas, um, let's talk about what's new in prevention. So there are already many ways that we think about HIV prevention. So education, condoms, syringe exchange and harm reduction, male circumcision is a newer idea, um, particularly come out of a lot of work in, in Africa. Um, PMTCT, which is a complex acronym, is prevention of maternal and child transmission, um, and post-exposure prophylaxis, already part of our, um, the list of things that we can use uh, for HIV prevention. Um, and to that, we've, in the last couple of years, we've added PrEP and treatment prevention, which are really taking the idea that you can use medication um, either in HIV negative people to prevent transmission to them, or in HIV positive people to prevent transmission to others. So starting with PrEP. So what is PrEP? I think most people in the room have heard of this term, but to define it a little bit, PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's the idea that you can prevent HIV infection by giving someone antiretrovirals before he or she is exposed to HIV so that that medication essentially stops the, the virus from being able to infect that person. Um, and we know this has, it works for other types of infections, and there are probably better examples than these, but for example, um, in uh, people with HIV and low CD4 counts, we give them back to prevent a poor MPCP. There are people who, um, you guys probably remember the, the big outbreak a couple of years ago with anthrax, everybody was worried about anthrax being sent through the mail. Everybody was rushing pharmacies to buy Cipro. Um, so that's going to be another example. And we know this actually works in HIV for people who have post-exposure prophylaxis, which was really uh, um, uh, started in um, if someone has a high-risk exposure and then we're given antiretrovirals to prevent them um, from developing HIV. So the question is, would this work more broadly in HIV? So if you're going to pick something to give to a person who is HIV negative to prevent them from acquiring HIV, how would you do it? So you want to pick a drug that would be safe, right? Because you don't want to give someone a drug that's very toxic. Um, it would be something that's potent, so it's, it's got to work. Um, it's got to be something that's easy to use, because I can't give someone a drug that they have to take six times a day and expect them to be able to do that. Um, and you need some evidence that this drug actually would work. Um, and so what that has led us to um, in all of the trials is uh, using uh, tenofovir, which is um, I think most people know is a, uh, a potent antiretroviral. Um, it's available as a pill in Viriad. It's actually um, been trialed um, in a gel. It's the, um, the insert for gel. Um, and then um, as a combination pill, not here plus MFSIV. And all the trials I'm going to talk to you about use either uh, tenofovir as a pill or as a gel or uh, true bottom. And then who would you test it in? So different groups of people have different risks that um, the, the different ways that they're put at risk of acquiring HIV, and uh, they have uh, potentially different ways in which they're acquired. It. So you end up having a bunch of different people um, who have potentially different risks and different ways they might acquire it, and therefore uh, we need to study the different people to make sure it's working those groups. So that's what happened. Um, there were two big trials that I'm going to talk a little bit about that came out. And I, again, this is. Um, at the AIDS Education Month, we already have a very uh, well-educated group of people here um, about HIV, so I apologize that this is stuff that these folks have already heard. The two big ones were uh, the Capriso 04 trial, which was done in South Africa and published in Science Magazine in uh, 2010. <coughs> and that was using this tenofovir gel. It's a gel basically that women insert somewhere around uh, within 12 hours before intercourse and within 12 hours after intercourse. Um, uh, to see whether that gel would prevent them from acquiring the HIV. The second trial um, that we're going to talk a little bit more about um, is the IPREX trial, which was giving um, high-risk high risk men with men, Truvada, 
which is again a combination of tenofovir and methotrexamine, um, and saying, if we give the, the, uh, these high risk men Truvada, uh, uh, will they have a, a decreased risk of getting HIV? So the answer to those trials was yes. Both of these actually showed a benefit. And in fact, there have been six trials uh, to date for which we have data. There are several other trials still ongoing. Um, but to summarize all these, I put this sort of messy looking table up here just yes. to show the these actually showed a benefit. And in fact, <coughs> so the Caprisa 004 trial was with the Tenofovir gel. It was done in um, uh, South Africa in a population where HIV is incredibly common. And uh, so, and with women who had a, a fairly high risk of acquiring HIV, it's very exciting because there are not many ways in um, other, particularly in other parts of the world, where women um, can necessarily control their risk. I mean, often mm -hmm. the options available available to them require their uh, male partner to put on a condom. Um, so this was actually exciting, and it allowed women um, a way to protect themselves. And basically. Take, take, take a group of women, half of them get this, this gel, and half of them um, get all of, this, um, all of the standard condoms, education, et cetera. But understanding that that, 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 you, that doesn't always happen again. They, some of these women did not have control of the exposure to this that they had. And the result of the trial was, yeah, there was about a 39% reduction. So that actually, it's not 100%. But it was a big difference in the number of people who were infected in the group that didn't have this gel and the people who did. Huge events. The IPREX trial was the inventive sex of men in six different countries, um, and, uh, giving them the Truvada pill. And it showed a 44% reduction in the men who, had, who had took the pill versus the men who, who didn't take the Truvada pill. Um, and with both of these trials, the interesting thing is afterwards, you can take all the data and you can look at it more closely. And um, you can see that the more people use the gel and the more people take the, took the pills, the more that protection was. So if you take it and break out the groups and, and say, well, how many people took, took the pill really every day versus how many people took the pill most days or not at all, that you can actually show that this, this, the effect is greater and greater the more people took the pills. Again, none of it was 100%, but it clearly showed that. There have been several other trials on the TDF2 trial was done in, uh, in Botswana, and the partners and another trial was done in the same group, clearly showed in South Africa, um, uh, looking at heterosexual couples. And the, the partners perhaps actually had three different arms. So the arm that received all the education uh, and comments, et cetera, the arm that received all that plus to not bear, the team that received all that plus to buy. And again, they signed it. Now, the interesting thing that we see is that there have also been two trials that show no effect, and so I think people wonder, well, what does that mean? We have four trials that say, yes, we clearly saw an effect, and two trials that have not been able to demonstrate an effect. And I would say that, that the answer to why you can see an effect in some trials and why you can see an effect in other trials, there is the conclusion you should draw from that is not that crap doesn't work. The, crap, the question is, it clearly works, that worked in four of the trials. Now, what are the situations that make it not have not work in these other Are they working so far? So, why did it work for saying but not two studies? So, there was a big difference in adherence for one thing. So, in the in the FEMCREP trial, the, the heterosexual heterosexual serum couples, so one partner is HIV, the other partner does not have HIV, and they followed them over time, gave gave the partner who didn't have HIV to protect him or her from acquiring it. <coughs> um, the, the, unfortunately, in the, in the FEMPA, that trial, the, um, about 40% of the people were actually taking it, which is just too small a number for us to be able to see that. So that was part of the explanation. Another part of the explanation is different study designs, is that the, um, the trial here, the voice trial with tenofovir gel, um, actually had women taking tenofovir gel every day. Uh, versus the uh, Caprisa 04, which really had people time right. And there's potentially some reason that that's a difference. Again, adherence was also an issue. And probably there are other reasons. Everybody's definitely going to fall asleep now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and there are other reasons that we don't understand. But I'll say that there are the reasons, just because there were trials that didn't show a fact, does not mean you should draw the conclusion that PrEP doesn't work. So PrEP clearly does work 
but you have to pick it with high adherence, and we still don't have it all figured out about which populations that work the best and what barriers, what barriers there are to making it effective, um, and how, how we should uh, move forward. So clearly in high-risk groups, this may help us prevent infections. This is important data. Um, and as I think most people that have heard, the FDA is poised to, um, uh, to approve uh, through product for, um, for patients who are um, in high-risk situations to prevent acquisition of HIV. So that's sort of the, the bottom line on that. I also want to take a couple of slides just to talk about treatment prevention um, before handing it over to you. So treatment prevention, <coughs> which again, I think it's sort of a, a buzzword and a buzz phrase um, in HIV care these days, um, is um, the idea that treating HIV positive people actually reduces the risk of them transmitting to HIV negative people. Um, it's interesting because this makes a lot of logical sense, and we have known this for a really long time. Studies have shown it be uh, uh, before, but we actually needed sort of a large, a big enough trial, a large enough amount of data to say, how big is the magnitude? How much protection do you get out of this? Um, and we actually got the data to prove this in 2011, which was um, presented at um, IAS in, uh, last year, um, in 2011 in Rome, got a standing ovation, um, which, you know, getting a bunch of, of scientific people to stand up and, uh, and to applaud is like a big deal. So standing ovation at IAS, big deal. Published in the Journal of Medicine, which is um, a, a fairly well-known medical <laughs> journal. Um, the trial was called HPTN052, and I've got to call this, so medical people, we don't come up with good names for a trial, so HPTN052, that's what it's called. It should have been called something really exciting, like treatment prevention, but that's what you get, HPTN052. Um, called the breakthrough of the year. So the study, because I think everybody needs to know a little bit of the background of it. Um, uh, study um, 1,763 serious scoring couples, so one person was positive, one person was negative. Everybody, just like with all of these trials, got the education, got the counseling use condoms, got medical care, all the stuff that we already know can reduce people's risk. But we know also that that, that doesn't pre prevent people from acquiring HIV all the time. So what other I think, options can we try? So half of, half of those couples then got um, it's the addition of putting, that, putting the HIV positive person on HIV therapy. It didn't matter whether it was CD4 count, didn't matter if they had anything else going on. And this was done in, in, um, in several countries, but in most of the countries where there's CD, where you don't start on HIV medications until your CD4 count is less than 250. So a bunch of, everybody got the standard of care for when to start medication, but this was saying, let's not care where their CD4 count is, let's just start them early anyway, and see if that prevents them from infecting their partners. And the answer was absolutely yes. Absolutely. So 25 patients in the study acquired HIV from their partners, but only one of them was from a partner who started therapy early, meaning the group that got immediate treatment. That is a huge, huge protection. That's 96% reduction in risk. And after this, when you know, after I said that, you do study, you go back and try to look at more data, that, that one infection from a partner who started on treatment early happened very soon after the beginning of the study. Meaning, and, and, and probably at a time when the, the HIV positive partner was not yet undetectable. So, this was a huge, huge reduction in risk just by treating the person who was positive to protect them from, um, uh, to protect their partner from acquiring HIV. So, we now know that treatment as prevention is incredibly effective. We all kind of, that makes sense anyway, we all kind of thought so. But this actually showed just how effective it could be. Again, Science Magazine called this the breakthrough of the year. Um, it might give us a way, actually, to end the epidemic by stopping transmission. And it's great evidence for, for, for um, testing and treating. I will say, I don't want to end on a positive note, but I do want to have, but still put the challenge out there to people that I know this is a boring looking bar graph, but I think it's an important one. Um, this was published by the CDC looking at the US and saying, in the U.S., there are slightly over a million people who are HIV infected. But if you look at who of that population is actually in treatment, on care, and undetectable, that's 28%. Which means that out of every 10 people with HIV, three of them are undetectable. 
So three out of 10 is disappointing um, for the United States here. Um, treatment as prevention um, will only work if we can get people treated, right? The other thing that I think is important to notice on this graph is that the first bar is HIV infected, the second bar is people who actually have been diagnosed. Um, and about 25%, about 20 excuse me, percent of people who are infected with HIV in the U.S. don't know it. And they uh, appear to be the, uh, the population that is causing the majority of new infections. So many people who are acquiring HIV are acquiring from people who also don't know they have HIV. So if people don't know they have HIV, they're probably not being treated for HIV. So treatment prevention, those people wouldn't work. Potentially, though, the partners of those, um, of those people are the ones we could target with giving them PrEP. Does that make sense? So if you are someone who is high risk, giving you PrEP could potentially protect you from getting HIV from this 20% of people who didn't know they had it. So these are still the challenges that are out there, um, but these are incredibly important data to show us that yes, there are new ways that we can um, approach reducing the, um, the, the burden of this epidemic and ultimately helping. Um, I think that's all of my section. I'm actually going to pass it back to Jane um, and Lisa. I'll take it. More new questions now. Couple of Are there any questions? How do you educate the people that are, are negative to start taking medication to prevent or prevention? That is an incredibly important question, and I would say that I, I don't have a complete answer for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's really hard, right? If, if you think, look at anybody who already has a disease, yeah. uh, has diabetes, has HIV, you know, people who know they have HIV and you know, uh, only a small percent of them are able to get undetectable. You look at people who have diabetes and how many of them get their sugars under control. And now you're saying, I mean, how you, I know you don't actually have HIV, but I want you to take this pill regularly. And that was the big problem we saw in those, in, in probably in those trials that yeah. didn't show benefit. So a, a huge piece of that is, is educational campaign, certainly. But a huge piece of that is also figuring out how, how do we tar target the intervention best? Is it realistic to tell somebody to take a pill every day, every day, every day? Mm -hmm. Or are there ways that we can say, that we can study it in, in, in smaller periods of time that are more manageable for people? Are there ways we can make it easier for people as less frequency, et cetera? Um, but that's the huge question. I don't have a great answer for you, but that is the problem. Yes. But isn't it also going to maximize how we educate people who's going to pay for it? That is. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and he's going to pay for it, and, um, and it was his appearance. So, um, yeah. I, I, and and uh, I agree with you. It would cost less to uh, to prevent the infection than to treat the person once infected, but that is not how our healthcare system is currently structured. Um, and, and I wish I had an answer for you on that, but I. I'm a physician and a politician. <laughs> no, it's a it's a it's a question that to which there is no answer. Yeah. This is a question about uh, the studies. Um, did they um, really, um, I guess, test out for maybe the people who did not have the virus that were that were taking the medication? Would it adhere to the other methods of prevention um, more so because they're taking the medication? Did they look at that at all? So because I'm taking antiretrovirals, um, and not, I'm not positive, um, would that make me start to use a condom more anyway? Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, so yes, that's actually one of the things that they look at, and they do, it's like, um, basically, they, in addition to doing sort of the pill counts to see how many people are on blood levels, people also all get the same education that they and they do kind these surveys about how much they've done. So uh, as far as we can tell, there's no difference in the any of the other interventions. And that's part of what you, what you call the randomization process. And, and you take this, this large group of people and randomly divide them into two groups and then give everybody the same intervention with just one thing different. So we're assuming that there's no other differences between this group and this group except the pill we're giving them. So that, for example, this group will all take, will all use condoms, this group won't. Um, and they, they did look at that and there was no difference between them. So that's a very important question.
have the scientific knowledge. We know that if people would take medicine in both of these circumstances, they could reduce their chances of passing on or acquiring HIV to extremely low uh, amounts. But the challenge here is, is really in figuring out can you, uh, can you actualize this um, in, the, in the real world. One of the things that I just want to mention, however, that I think is important to, to sort of throw in this pot, there's actually a, a pretty big amount of fairly consistent data that says that most people who find out that they're HIV infected do take steps to try to prevent others from becoming infected. And if people were aware, if policy in Philadelphia were to change so that it would reflect what is public policy in, in New York City, and in San Francisco, that everyone be offered HIV treatment when infected, offered, not forced, offered, we will actually save a difference. Anyway, moving on. Um, Luis Montaner is somebody who we at Philadelphia Fight have been working with um, since we were a very new organization and since he came to the Wistar Institute. Luis is a professor at the Wistar Institute, um, and we have been working together on studies to boost the natural function of the immune system since 1995. Luis received his DVM in veterinary medicine. It's always an interesting thing about Luis. <laughs> um, at Kansas State University and his DPhil in experimental pathology at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. He joined the Wistar Institute in 1995. At Wistar, his laboratory combines virologic and immune system-based research using laboratory models and by working with patients enrolled in clinical trials. In addition to Philadelphia, these studies have been conducted in California, Puerto Rico, Mexico, and South Africa. He's a sought-after national and international lecturer, has published over 80 papers in the scientific literature. His, variety, his collaboration with Fight is focused on a variety of ways to harness the immune system to control HIV, from structure treatment interruption studies that we were doing several years ago, to immune boosters such as pegylated interferon work that he will be discussing um, today. He was the lead investigator in his research that will be presented at this workshop. Thank you, Jane, and uh, you can uh, just give me one second to get out of the previous uh, presentation. I will start. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And hopefully, <coughs> and we're ready to go. All right. So Jane asked me to sort of review uh, in a nutshell what we have been engaged on in the last five years because we've come up to the point where we now know what actually happened uh, and, and it's good news and I'm going to tell you about that and it's really about controlling HIV and making our own bodies respond in a way that can control the virus without the continued dependence on antiretroviral therapy. There's some caveats to that statement, and we'll get to that at the end. But the news are hopeful, and I hope that if nothing else, you will leave here knowing that we're excited about what direction we're going. But to put that in context, I think it's important to sort of note the HIV infection as a whole, because we just talked about PrEP, and we talked about the initial stage of the infection. And what you're seeing here is just sort of a very sort of simplistic diagram that in red is the virus, and in the bars are your CD4 count of someone that is infected, and as you know, you have high bars when you are in health, and as you progress in disease, those bars decline. And at acute infection, you have a lot of red because you have a lot of virus, and that's the target of PrEP, is actually to actually inhibit the virus from ever getting in. And that's, as we just heard, a very effective way to stop the epidemic if we can actually get more people treated. But unfortunately, the majority of people are in the middle meaning that they have progressed with their disease, they have required therapy, 
and now they are on a lifelong journey to manage their disease for the rest of their life. So what do we do about them? And how can we end the epidemic by targeting those that are infected into a cure? I think I've used this diagram before, and I'll revisit it in a couple of slides to illustrate really the concept that if you basically have the immune system, which is the engine here, the machine, and virus that is trying to drive it to a point that it breaks it. And I think that's the concept behind the virus that remains uncontrolled and eventually collapses your immune system from protecting yourself against other things that everyone else that has a healthy immune system can survive with. But a person without an immune system cannot. And we know that if we treat, we cannot. Basically, and we know that, that, that in our bodies, we cannot. Basically, we generate the capacity that once we stop the virus from replicating, our immune systems will rebuild themselves. And we will, again, be in health because we can now not have diseases that otherwise we would be susceptible to. And this is now illustrated with sort of the machine looks shiny and everything is fine, except for the fact that we have drug that is holding back the virus. The virus is still there. The machine looks shiny and, and everything is fine, the except for the fact that we have that drug virus that is holding it back away. The virus doesn't matter the machine looks shiny and everything is It doesn't matter whether your ears are part, if you ever stop, it will come back. And that's what we refer to as the threshold that we need to pass in order to cure somebody from HIV. So we'll refer to that as the HIV reservoir. So we want a cure. And what does that mean? So let's start by saying, what does a cure mean? Well, there's two big ideas out there. One is that the virus is gone, period. That there is no viral replication, and you don't have to treat anyone. That basically that's what we call about when we talk about eradication. Out. Beneath. The next concept is that, well, we can't get rid of it, but we'll keep it at bay. This is, we'll maybe tolerate a little bit of replication, but nothing that will worry anybody. And definitely without antiretroviral therapy. So we'll talk about that as the functional cure. And functional, meaning that your immune system can still function in the presence of the virus just as if you didn't have it. But then it becomes kind of gray as to, well, how much is too much? And the field has sort of veered, put that on the side and said, well, that's nice, but let's go after the gone thing. Let's go after complete eradication of the virus because no one can really agree what amount of virus. So how do we get rid of the persistent HIV that I referred to earlier as the reservoir? Well, there's three big ideas. And the first is we'll jam the keyhole so that HIV cannot get through the door. Basically, break the key that HIV, break the lock that HIV needs to use in order to get in. And if you break the lock, you can't get in. And that's one idea, because the virus needs some steps to get into a cell. And if you break that, or if you block it, there's no way for the virus to come in. The next is, well, expose and starve the virus out. Activate everything that you can to get the virus out of anywhere that you can find it and make sure that it has nowhere to go after that. So we'll just basically starve it out. Now that makes the assumption that there's no food around for the virus, number one, and that you've actually gotten all the virus to come out, number two. Again, kind of gray, but that's the concept. And the third, and the holy grail, is that, well, let's just serve the, send a search party and kill every single virus that we have. Let's teach our immune system to seek out and kill, basically. And how do we do that? How do we teach our immune systems to go out and kill every single piece of virus that somebody has in their system? And those are the three ideas that the cure is pursuing. All right, so the first one, the close the keyhole. Can we do it in people? The answer is yes. You heard from Mr. Brown this morning. He is a living example that this can be done. You break the keyhole, you cure HIV relative to the settings that he undertook that basically went after that concept. They took all the cells out and they put cells in that couldn't allow the virus to get in. And what happened? The virus dissipated and was gone. 
Do we know it works? Well, he tells us that he that it seems to work, right? So that is as a as a as a cure strategy, it's gaining a lot of sort of it, uh, uh, excitement that this is a direction that we can take in order to cure somebody from HIV. Can we use it as a therapy now? Well, we've heard no, we can't because. We, the mortality risks of what he undertook are too great to just be in our heart and waiting it up. If you were to sort of put it in a balance, say, well, 30% death or take art and live for 100% chance. How about the ethnic groups that are not from Europe and don't have yet? That's right. And, but, but as a proof of concept that the concept of breaking the lock works, mm -hmm. this person shows that. Now the, now the objective is how do you break the law on everybody? Uh -huh. And that's what the research is trying to do. So what are we doing to make it happen? There's several groups that are trying to go after gene therapy and going in and basically cutting out the CCR5, cutting out the piece that the virus needs. And that's the research that's currently underway. There's a group here in Philadelphia, Carl June, there's another group, Paul Cannon, there's a company, Sangamo in California, that's really going to go up. up selling you their particular little uh, strategy that seeks that objective, and we'll see. We don't know whether it's going to work. We hope it's going to work. But that's the direction that this idea is taking. So the next one is, well, expose it and starve it out. Can we do it in people? Well, maybe and maybe not. Because the strategies that are being considered to start to sort of expose everything out are kind of like, uh, you try and kill a cockroach so you land a nuclear bomb on the city. And you say, well, I'm sure I'm going to get them all. But the fact that everyone lives there, well, that's just too bad. So that's kind of like the word that we're coming in with these tools that are so powerful that are they going to do other damage and not just expose the HIV? And that's really the question that we're trying to answer. So that's what the research now is doing, is taking these drugs that are basically like when you lift the rock and all the rocks are underneath the rock. So it's kind of like that. You're basically lifting up and seeing the HIV and seeing whether it's true that you can lift the rock and see the HIV and do no harm. That's where the research is now. So if they can find a drug that could lift the rock and we can see the HIV clearly and nothing else happens, then we can move forward and, and test it. Uh, so any evidence that it works, in, in the lab it does, you add the drug, the virus lights up, great. Right? And the question is now, does, would it work in a person? And that's kind of like where we are. So can we use it for therapy now? No, because we're still trying to develop the concept of taking this forward. So the last one is, well, develop your commando approach and go after the virus wherever you can find it. And can we do it in people? Well, I think it's more likely because we know of people that do this. The elite controllers, for example. People that walk around without any drug and control the virus to undetectable levels. We're like in awe of that situation. Say, well, if only we could do that with everybody. But it's like Mr. Brown. There are people who show us that that is possible. The question is, how do we get from here to there? So, Will that be a functional cure, in that we want to make people elite controllers? Or how are we going to move into eradication? Because the elite controllers don't get rid of their virus. So maybe they are showing us what a functional cure is going to be like, but not what eradication is going to take. So can we use anything for therapy now? Well, I think first you have to find a strategy. Show me a strategy that somebody that is taking drug can become like an elite control that uses your immune system. Show me one, a paper, one paper that shows me that. The answer, I don't have anything to show you. I can't. No one has shown that when you remove therapy, the virus stays controlled. Now, that's obviously a pun because I'm going to show you data that suggests that we have seen that. But it's just to give you the preamble that that hasn't been shown yet. We can show that if we treat with the vaccine or whatever, we can prevent infection. We can show that if I take the cells from somebody and I put virus in the lab, they kill. So great, that means that this mechanism is working. 
We can show that in monkeys, I can, I can give them an infection that progresses in less than two years, so it's not like the human infection. Uh, and I can intercede and see an effect. And all of these things are exciting and are needed. But then when you come back and say, okay, well, that's all great. And how many people can go from part to control? That lost the control to begin with because they've taken drugs. And the answer is none today. But I'll show you some people that might have done that. So, to give you an example of this idea of trying to instruct your immune system, uh, Jane noted that we, uh, like others, thought that we had a good idea on instructing the immune system. So, we thought, well, maybe if we recover our immune system, we just need to show it the virus, but not really let the virus do too much harm. So, let's just stop the drug and see the virus, the virus come back. And as soon as the virus comes back, just stop the drug back on and your immune system the virus, the virus come back. And as soon as it's affected, but they're going to see the virus. So now they're going to like build up all the resistance that we want to achieve. Sounds logical, right? So that's exactly what we did. We took two people, we kept them under on drug, or we gave them these sort of breaks, and then we measured the T cell response, which is a type of response that long-term non-progressors, people that don't progress, have very high levels of. And we can measure them in the lab. And this is what they look like. For example, these dots that you see on these circles is the amount of that's a single cell responding against HIV. And the only thing you need to know is that there's more dots as you go along the place. So we said, okay, well, they're getting yes, inside the what we thought they needed. Responding so against HIV. Here we go. Let's stop the therapy only on know. everyone that stayed on therapy, and let's stop therapy in those that had all these increases in the dots. And what happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The fact that these T cells, are showing a positive response, are increasing, are did not relate to a clinical outcome. They relate to a laboratory outcome, but not a clinical outcome. And that was very discouraging. And that was 2004. We just saw that the Merck, you know, the, the step trial on vaccines that build on the same type of responses didn't work either. So that sort of takes us that even after you recover function, the virus wait for the T cells. So what's up with the T cells? You know, how do we wake them up? How do we make them control? Because if we find how to make control happen, then we can start talking about a cure. But we can't talk about the cure through an immune response until we find a way to make the immune system work. So what else are people doing now? Well, they're still pursuing a vaccine. Uh, they, they, Maybe with the concept that, well, you know, maybe you didn't develop the right type of T cell. Your virus just trumped everything, so now we'll give you a vaccine and you'll get the right T cells. <coughs> and, uh, and it's a hope. It's worth testing. I don't, myself, I, from 1 to 10, I'll give it a 3. Because, it, I mean, how many times do you have to ask the same question and get the answer back? It, there's no data that I'm aware of that in human populations, a clinical trial has shown that a T cell augmentation through a vaccine has led to control. So, still worth pursuing, but we'll see. The next one is take the foot off the brake. You know, just HIV just is putting too much burden on your T cell response. So just remove all of the negative signals that are taking this response down and let it let it go. That's the other concept. There's like molecules that we can use therapeutically that release the brakes on all your T cell responses. So they become really hot. I mean, they just go after everything. And in the monkeys, it works. It actually reduces the virus. In some settings of the lab, it increases the right response. So it's really helpful. But like the activation side that we talked earlier, the problem here becomes in, well, what else is going to light up? Meaning that are you going to have some sort of bad outcome, like autoimmunity, or so you're going to respond to yourself? now with perhaps a greater frequency. Some of the early data suggest that that's not an immediate outcome, at least in monkeys, but it's still a concern. It's kind of like a lingering in the background, saying, well, let's see whether that remains a risky approach or not. Won't that destroy the blood cells? I'm sorry? Won't that destroy blood cells? Well, that's, yes. The, the potential for going after good cells is the concern. Yeah. That hasn't happened in lab, but the in the context of the human, it still remains 
uh, a question that you want to make sure that, that you take account of. And the last one is, can we fertilize the immune system? You know, can you actually just, like you fertilize your garden, you know, just miracle grow, just throw it out there and wait for that right type of blossom to come out. Because you've got what you need, it's just that you don't have the right care. So we're going to just try to take care of the immune system, not by targeting one thing, but by targeting the entire room. You know, we're just going to spray the room and everyone in the room that's your immune system is going to take advantage of that and do the right job. Sounds like a like concept, right? Well, that's actually the immunotherapy approach. We're going to just take a drug that affects your entire immune system and we're going to ask the question, does that move you in the right direction or not? So we decided to do that with interferon alpha. And then here's my little diagram again. And now we've removed the drug, we've brought in the water, and all these little red people are coming out to block the water. So we are hypothesizing that if we fertilize the immune system with interferon alpha, it will work. Why can we do that? First, because it's the only immunotherapy approved by FDA that's on the shelf. Everybody else needs to go through the FDA. This is already gone through the FDA. Number two. Is the only immunotherapy that has cured a chronic viral infection. It, it's hepatitis C. It's a treatment for hepatitis C. No other chronic viral infection has a cure. Hepatitis C does. Number three, no one has actually tested interferon alpha when your immune system has recovered. All the interferon alpha studies that were done in the past were in, when there was no heart. So your immune system was broken and you were adding something to fertilize. It's almost like saying that you've broken the stalk on your plant and you're throwing fertilizer in and saying, well, why isn't it blossoming? Because you have a stalk and nothing else. So if you let it blossom first and then add your fertilizer, then you'll get your flowers. So it's kind of like the same idea. No one had tested it. So we decided with Fidelity 5 to go after that, to say, can we show whether this is going to work or not? So the immune system has a lot of players, and I'm not suggesting that you even try to take this on board, but I hope that you all have played chess, so that you know that when you go after beating the other side, you have different pieces, and each piece has a particular capacity, and the immune system is the same. You have a lot of different pieces with different capacities, and we put our eggs into the queen, or the rook, or the pawn, and we say, well, I'm going to give you more queens. And if you play chess, you say, well, that's great, because if I have more queens, I'm going to win. And the T-cell response is like the queen. Everyone has honed into the queen and say, if I can just get more queens, I'll win. And, but getting the second queen has not happened yet. But that doesn't stop people from saying, well, but if I had to choose one, I'm still going to choose the queen. And we, on the other side, decided to not really bother about the queen and just go out to the board and say, we'll just give interferon alpha and let the immune system tell us what the outcome of that would be. <clears throat> so we randomized people to receive two different doses of immunotherapy during their antiviral therapy and then ask them to stop their antiviral therapy and continue their interferon alpha. Again, sort of fertilizing the ground first and then asking, do we get the blossoms or not? once you remove the antiviral therapy. And obviously to do this, we needed people that were committed because this is like weekly injections, 29 of them. Interferon alpha makes you feel very, very sick. And we had to tell them nothing else has worked. So we're trying this, but if you're asking me, does it have a shot? I can say, well, it has a shot theoretically, but nothing else has worked, but we really want to find out. So please participate. And they did. So I think that the information that we gained is because those people said yes. And I think that they are, that's who we truly are indebted to. Uh, the people that actually offered themselves to give us the answer to this question. So this is what we knew. We knew that we stopped therapy and everyone came back. The first patient on the study kept the virus completely suppressed in the presence of interferon alpha. One of, the study, one of the doctors in the study said, I don't believe that they're taking their drugs anyway, they're just coming for the business. So you have to go to the pharmacy and make sure that the drugs are not being refilled. We did, and they haven't been refilled. But he wasn't, this person wasn't the only one. We actually noted that nine of the 20 people 
had the same control outcomes. And this, this doesn't become sort of a one-off. Because if you, if you think about 20 people walking through the door and you saw it in nine of them, so that starts to tell you that this is not a chance outcome. So they remain suppressed, which are the blue and the, and the, and the red lines basically say that they are having a good outcome for a long time. For six months, they were able to keep the virus. If you stop heart without anything, the virus will come back in two weeks. So we tracked our CD4s, they were fine. You don't have to know anything other than all the lines look just great. Um, <laughs> then the next issue is, well, remember the diagram and the virus was still there? So is the virus still there? Because, again, if you think about this sort of search and kill, then did we find anything apart from just stopping the virus? And the answer was maybe yes. And that's where the excitement comes in. And I know that these graphs are that impressive because you probably, we're very excited about the graphs kind of tending down on, on this side. And that's never been observed before either. But it's not a lot. But it's enough to be potentially real. And when you then sort of decide what the likelihood of this being observed in such few people at the right time point, because they've taken their interferon, the probability of this not being true starts to go down and down and down and down. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we have released something that has allowed us to even think about a reservoir reduction? Because obviously we don't want to say cure, because that sounds too, too big of a word. But it's certainly hopeful that it's a part of the process towards a cure. And that's kind of like where we are. So again, in the chessboard, we put our emphasis on the board. And then when we actually look back into the patients and say, well, what was it about their response that made it? Was it the queen? Was it the rook? In the same type of analogy, it's like saying that it, it was the pawns. It was the sort of response that you don't think twice about not paying much attention to. Because in the immune response, there's two sides. There's the innate side, which is what we all have when we're born. And they're the side that we teach with vaccines. And what interferon alpha, the actual cells that we have identified to be in part contributing to these are the innate cells, the cells that are at the front of the response, the ones that we don't think about, the ones that we say, well, they're expendable. They do their job at the beginning and then they're gone. And we have to go after the commander. We have to go after the rooks and the horses and, and the queens. We don't waste time in the rooks. And that's the other eye opener that it suggests that we have might not be looking in the right place and perhaps put it all together then you're saying well new strategy first one new type of cell player so where is this going to take us so it's the first proof of concept that we can make someone control the virus without antiviral therapy and that it did restrict replication and that it did decrease integrated levels but it was few people, it was 20 people. It was also people with very high CD4 counts. So maybe this only works on like, you know, exceedingly good immune systems. We were also cannot rule out that it, it is dependent on interferon because we didn't have a no interferon strategy. We didn't stop interferon and then say what happened. That still remains a question. So I'm not suggesting this is the answer. I'm just saying these are the questions and the limitations that we have. So, although most thought that it would not work, because nothing else has, and because it's implicit that we're activating the immune system in order to do this, it does suggest that it's at least an idea about potentially treating reservoirs. And it raises the possibility that you can maybe think about interferon together with like the expose and starting out strategy. Because now you have something like, you know, you raise the rock, You'll see the box when you'll have a ray pan right next to you that you just know to spray into the box. And that's kind of like the idea. Because if you don't have the rank pan, then the box will just go and crawl under some other one. But if you at least have these two things working at the same time, maybe you'll have a better shot. And the story has an incredible number of actors in, like, you know, the movies where you see all these scrolls. <laughs> So the story is very straightforward and only took me about 20 minutes to tell you, but it took over like more than 100 people and five years for me to tell you what I just did. 
So they are really the sort of the cast behind this uh, this idea. And I will end it. Thank you. Yes, I would like to find out how how can people tolerate that antibiotic treatment. Yes, it, it, I mean it's hard to even give people with hepatitis C. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and and that was a concern: uh -huh. the tolerability of the drug or how the toxicity was going to be managed was a big concern. And what is the time? Now? And and that was managed. And what I can tell you that that of the 23 people that started the drug, yes. there were three of them who chose to step out and not take it anymore okay. because they were depressed. Okay. And but there was but that in itself was it was expected because we know that interferon makes you depressed. Okay. And most people that are being treated for hepatitis choose to stay because they have a cure to look forward to. In this case we didn't know. So if you're feeling depressed then you better stop because it's not like you're waiting for something that makes it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't know what was going to happen. So the right decision is if you're not feeling well, you should stop your treatment. And that's what happened. So, so there were three of 20 that elected to stop because of the system. I have another question. How about the, the newer uh, 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 interferon and, and, and treatment yes. that's coming out? That's right. There's new interferon lambda and there's other strategies. But again, this is sort of like, this is a door that has opened. Okay in this idea as to how many other strategies could get the same result is obviously a research question we we'll forward. Thank you. These are really incredibly complicated ideas and this was really incredibly complicated research. And so could we again express our appreciation for Louise Parker. To, to Rob Lehman. Rob Lehman has a long history, history of service to the HIV community here and, and elsewhere in the United States and was one of the people who was really providing help and assistance in the years when there just really wasn't all that much from a strictly medical perspective that you could do. He was a founder of the AIDS Community Residence Association in Durham, North Carolina, the first AIDS hospice in the country outside of New York and San Francisco. And he was the founding chef of the Metropolitan AIDS Neighborhood Nutrition Alliance, better known as FAHA, in Philadelphia, which as you know made an enormous difference in the lives of so many people who were sick when there really wasn't medicine and there really wasn't treatment. He's also the author of Cooking for Life, A Guide to Nutrition and Food Safety for the HIV Positive Community. And we're really pleased he was able to join us today. Thank you. Um, what Jane didn't mention is that uh, I have been in a position sort of as a provider for a number of years and different levels. I mean, back 30 years ago, there were people who would sleep on my sofa because they'd been tossed out of their house or something like that. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm proud that my book is still available, but I'm more pleased to say that wasting is not the problem that it used to be. Um, I don't see anyone who looks wasted in this audience. And, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it would have been a very different story. Um, and that's, that's the wonderful good news of where HIV has gone and where it's presumably going now. But, um, the, uh, so I worked on uh, hospice concerns, I worked with nutrition, uh, and I um, worked on research, uh, and all of that was very thrilling work. And then about eight years ago, I seriously converted and became HIV positive myself. And one of the things that always surprises me is that I don't get asked more really at all, what the hell were you thinking? Um, because uh, if anybody was in a position to know the risks and the outcomes and the you know, potential damage of being exposed to HIV and contracting HIV, it was me. Um, and I think this underscores that all of the things like condom fatigue and just sheer irresponsibility are very real factors in the world, not to mention people who don't have control of their own um, sexual rights to their own bodies and stuff. So 
all of this research about um, prophylactic treatment uh, or a cure, I think is the only realistic way to, to stop the epidemic because, again, if anybody should have known better, it was me. And, and here I am before you today, HIV positive. Um, well, the good news for me was um, I, um, I knew that I was negative. I had been tested any number of times. And then I had the famous flu-like symptoms that uh, were pretty severe <coughs> enough to get me to a doctor, a high fever, and when they did uh, blood studies to see what infection I might have, uh, found that I had very high white blood cell count, which um, uh, indicated something other than the norm was going on. Uh, I was tested for HIV and it came back positive, and through my doctor was placed with uh, an infectious disease doctor, Dr. Jay Kosman, and uh, was immediately put on antiretroviral therapy. Uh, and have continued on that. Uh, and I have to say my response has been very good. Um, my, my viral burden is undetectable, <coughs> and my most recent uh, CD4 count was uh, 1,050, which uh, I'm, I'm very lucky. Uh, I was very lucky to, uh, you know, to get myself to a very lucky way to uh, have an adventure right away. You would get myself to a very lucky way to have an identity out. I'm still on that antiretroviral therapy um, because I trust my doctor and I think that he's given me, especially in line with the information that's presented today, um, the right advice. Um, I, uh, that's mostly what I have to say to you um, is uh, I, I can't say strongly enough, um, you know, that just because somebody should know better doesn't mean that they're going to be protecting themselves. Um, what I'll say in terms of my position now and all of the issues like common fatigue or irresponsibility, back when I was negative, I knew I was only putting myself at risk. Uh, if I were to have unprotected sex with someone now, I would be putting someone else at risk. That's a very different kettle of fish. Uh, so uh, the, the issue of, of responsibility is very different in my situation now than it was before. Um, that's pretty much what I have to say. I don't know if anybody has any questions for me as a, as a uh, consumer and provider of HIV services, but uh, I, I think my experience underscores what these gentlemen would have said uh, in the earlier por portion of this program. Yes, sir? I don't know if you're the right person to answer or something else to say, but um, one of the uh, uh, confusions that this seminar was the discussion of policy Those of us that are not in the medical field and don't have the opportunity to participate in research work, we do something that we can uh, assist with in terms of uh, uh, public policy. I think Jane Shaw will be like this one with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, would they, before Jane gets up, did anyone else have any questions for me? I was going to ask a quick one. So that was available a few years ago, didn't you? Yes. <coughs> um, you know my doctor? First of all, my name is Kwame, and um, I'm a long-term survivor of being diagnosed with HIV in 1988. And one of the things that I'm interested in is how does interferon, and maybe this is not the question, for me, but how does interferon help my immune system gain a better fight against the disease if I'm not plugged into uh, interferon treatment? I think that's a question for those. So, shall I turn this over now? Thank you, Bob, for his thoughtful and really relevant comments in this. Um, so, we have time for some questions. I will just say one thing about Lynn's question about, um, about public policy which is this, one way that we can look at the fact that every year for the past however many years we see 56,000 new HIV infections in the United States and that that number doesn't seem to go up very much or go down as well, it's good, it's not getting worse. The other way to look at it is it is a great failure of public policy that we have not been able to figure out a way to make it clear to people that they're what their risk is and found ways to, to encourage people to take steps to reduce that risk. 
what this what this information provides, particularly the information on treatment as prevention and pre-exposure prophylaxis, is potentially another direction in which we could go, which would be to really harness the goodwill and the energy of people living with HIV, not say to them, wait until you're sick before you start taking medicine, but offer them the possibility, you know, a long time ago, you know, somebody had a slogan, HIV stops with me, which is one of those common slogans, but offer people the possibility to really protect the people who they're in contact with, the people who they love. That's the potential here. And if, and if, if we could find ways to do it, it would make an, an enormous difference. Secondly, what we've also heard, both in the opening session and from police today, is that there are a series of efforts, there's a lot of efforts now, looking toward cure. Now, you know, the way we titled this, this workshop was we could end the epidemic, and we probably could in the sense of no more new people becoming infected if we could find a way to use these tools. But that's not going to cure the people living with HIV today. So the other very important direction here that we've also heard about is while we're not there yet, there are more than one or two people working on this, even right here in Philadelphia, even right in Philadelphia fight, and that there are a variety of approaches that really might bear fruit in that direction. So the other question that was asked is, well, how does interfere on work? So, so to answer your question, uh, the short answer is that it's working for you now. Okay. Uh, and it's, it works for all, it, it, it's part of a, a working immune system that this component will help in controlling any infection. Like after you're flu infected or whatever, it's one of the responses that starts the process. So that, and in the analyses that have been done in individuals that are the elites, you know, the ones that control the virus very to a very low level. They've been able to show that these responses are there in, to some extent with, with, uh, with a greater extent. So, but not in all of them, in some of them. So, so the, the right way to think about it is that in a normal immune system, it's a very important component that helps the control occur. In a system that is not working, it may be a good strategy to jump start it. But as far as what can you do with someone that already has control, for example, can you introduce this to jump start what it can you for them with someone that already up? has control and go even deeper in their control? That question also is an open question. We don't know. Uh, we would have to do a study where we treated individuals that are not taking antiretroviral therapy that have a very low level, and then ask, well, were they able to take that level to even a lower level, and was it sustainable? And that is a research question. Question? Uh, I'm wondering if somebody could give us a quick skinny on the vaccine and where we are with that. Um, the, the, the state of the vaccine is that it's very exciting because for the first time in the last uh, five, in, in, in the 20 years, there have been a whole blossoming of, inf of, of identification of types of antibodies that are able to block HIV very efficiently. For almost 15 years, we were tracking two or three of these and trying to model vaccines to model these three. And now, in the last four years, there's been like an explosion of, of antibodies that do this by different techniques. And now we're all course of 60 or 70 of these. And it now has become possible to start harnessing that information towards a vaccine, whether it be giving you the genetic information for how to make them in a gene therapy vaccine, like some groups are doing, or having enough of these around that you can then try to design vaccines that could replicate them. So I think that from the point of view of the vaccine, there's been a lot of development in the last three years that has changed the dynamic now as to what tools are available by which to generate a vaccine that may work. Question? Uh, just to bring it back to the public health, the uh, portion of it. Uh, you know, we're having programs. You put up a graph early, I think, when you got to put up a graph early about when people uh, know they have the virus there, they're more likely uh, not to spread the virus. 
Um, and I would add a caveat to that. I, would, I mean, a director of a drug and alcohol program, when people are, are on drugs, they have a more propensity to spread the virus or forget about the fact that they have virus that are spreading it. And in terms of our, our state where uh, the program is spreading and the fund in terms of public policy, we forget about uh, the other programs that you're not open for the benefit component of it, but there's so many other components of social services components of it that needs to be strengthened and that's the community I think that we need to um, come together and enforce these uh, changes uh, that, that's the important point. Uh, you had a question that I cut off oh, thank you. I actually had a question about any of the prep studies working with IV drug users and whether that uh, method of infection was uh, different or prohibited in any different way. Yeah, it's a good question. I say that I don't. Um, we don't have data. Oh, sorry. Um, it's it's a good question, and that is a group that um, is being studied, but we don't have data yet on that. So um, one would again, we have shown that prep works in sex with men in serious sporting couples, but but the the data for IV drug users, we, we don't have have that yet. So the first question is what happens in the CD4 count and those that suppress the virus? And the answer is in state state, we were expecting that interferon is known to drop the CD4 count because it drops the entire blood cell number in the in, in not just the CD4 count. And we were we didn't know whether that would continue to go down or, or to what extent it would go below a level that we weren't comfortable with. And uh, so it just dropped proportional to the highest amount. Yeah. Those that had the high CD4 had the biggest drop. Those that had sort of 500 didn't drop as much. And then after the five weeks, it stayed the same for the 24 weeks. So we didn't see any decrease of CD4 that was observed in those people that control the virus. Then the second question, uh, whether it would be a good idea to test longer than six months, I think is the next study. But remember that when we did this, we were asking whether it would be true for three months when most people thought it would not be true for two weeks. So now we have the luxury of saying, well, we actually looked at six months, so how much longer could you go? And I, I don't know the answer. Okay, we're almost out of time, so can you get the last comment or question? Yes, that's all this. I'm sorry? Stem cell research. The stem cell research. Most of the stem cell research for the cure is after trying to deplete the CCR5 uh, from ever getting into any of the cells that will be developed from any, uh, a, a stem cell. So that a lot of that work is is targeted to try to replicate what it means to round outcome in taking the stem cell, getting rid of the CCR5, putting it back into a person, and then determining whether that could out whether that would expand in a person as the cells that have CCR5 would increasingly be depleted by the virus. So eventually, the virus will find nowhere to go, uh, and that's. I think we're only under investigation. So I don't think there's going to be a trial in humans from the stem cell side. The, the one of the groups that is leading that was here earlier this month, and they were noting that it would be within two years that they would be humans. Okay, we are at the closing time. I hope that you are leaving more hopeful than when you came in. Um, and can we just thank our panelists one more time? out the evaluation forms and hand them in in the back of you. And join us in the room. We will be taking a brief intermission till 2.30 and then we'll be back live. Thank you.